Can, can I record on my end, by the way? That's. Can you record it? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Would that be okay? I mean, I guess that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you. I can send you the recording with captions as well, Jeremy. Oh gosh, that would be even better. Okay, I'll, I will be right back. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, people. We're just giving a few minutes for uh, everyone to, to join in, uh, and we'll get started in, in just another minute or so. Oh. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Stephen Gilliland, uh, professor here at uh, Claremont Graduate University. And uh, we are about to start the final of our spring uh, public sector leadership webinars. Uh, this morning, we've got Jeremy Hunter, who's an associate professor of practice on the Drucker School of Management and also founding director of the Executive Mind Leadership Institute. Uh, Jeremy is uh, just a, a real treat to have as our uh, cleanup hitter in this uh, webinar series. Uh, he gives a lot of addresses, uh, keynote addresses and so on. Uh, just a really gifted speaker with some fascinating ideas on uh, how leadership really starts from within inside your mind. So I'm not going to give too much else uh, because Jeremy does a wonderful job of introducing the topic. Jeremy, let me turn it over to you and thank you for uh, presenting today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Stephen. And good morning to everybody. And thank you to the whole team for putting this together. It's, uh, you know, it's a group and community effort. So this doesn't happen you know, on its own. So uh, I want to acknowledge everybody. Kaylin, you're back there somewhere. Thanks for all your help. And Regina is out there in the ether as well somewhere. So we want to acknowledge her and her her work and then all my wonderful colleagues at the university. So let's jump into it. Um, in the last year, th this will be, I, I, I pared this particular talk down a little bit because I wanted to have more space to have a conversation than, than I normally would. And uh, so this will be ideally a dialogue or we'll have some interactivity in a, in a way. Uh, and so I wanted to make time for that. And then we'll also have quest questions at the end. But as, uh, it, last March, I started, you know, you could start to see what the tea leaves were starting to say regarding the pandemic and the virus and the global nature of it. And, and I started to think about, okay, what is my own kind of professional response to this situation? And, and this is the, the program I developed around this called The Storm Makes You Stronger. And and it comes from this Haruki Murakami novel, Kafka on the Shore, and this line that I think crystallizes for me the internal challenge that the pandemic offers us, right? One thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in, right? And that's what the storm is all about. Now, the question is like, who is that person gonna be? And now that we're a year and what, a year and a half plus or minus, through this experience, thinking about who were you say in January, 2020 versus who are you now in June of 2021? One of my questions is like, what's different, right? What's different? What's different about you? What's different about your family, right? The people you work with, because in this issue of the kind of reintegration, like as we go back to the office, one of the things that I think is important to acknowledge is that you are not the same people who left the office a year and a half ago. And so a lot of the conversations I've been reading and having with, with organizations about how do we kind of uh, return 
have been functional. Like, okay, how much are we going to work from home? How much are we going to work for the office and or work in the office and all of that? And they haven't been so much internal. Like, what do you care about, right? What do you care about now that you didn't care about a year and a half ago? And, and I think those are actually at some level just as important as the questions of um, what, you know, how, how are we going to make the office work operationally? Okay. So, because we are not the same people we were a year and a half ago, and that needs to be acknowledged and explored. So I, I think when we face crisis, we have three options. One is to collapse, right? And which isn't really an option, but it happens. The other option we have, because, you know, we, the system gets overwhelmed, we get overwhelmed and, and, um, uh, and, and we you know, kind of lose structural integrity as it were. The other one, which I think is probably the most common one is cope. Like how do I keep my head above water and how do I just keep going, right? And I think this is ideal for a temporary situation, but it isn't ideal for, you're not getting the promise of what crisis offers in a way. So I, I think basically my bias is that you only have one option when we do these things, which is to transform. And, and how do you use these situations to come out of it better than you were before, right? And, uh, and how do you use these kind of disjunctures in the rhythm of how things kind of normally go to choose a different kind of path? So, you know, that is my own personal story. If you're interested, this, this is my TED talk about how, you know, I was 20 years old, which was 30 years ago, and faced with uh, uh, a diagnosis that said, basically, I had 10% chance of living past 25, right? And my own response to that was, okay, how do I use this? You know, how do I use this basically as an internal challenge for myself? And and it became this, it became an exploration of what did I need to change about myself that got me into this situation of being sick in the first place, right? And then that, then something worked, <laughs> here I am. Uh, but so I know, you know, and there's an N of one that says, okay, this theory actually works, but I, I think it actually is more than an N of one. But, but, you know, how do you use crisis as a means of self-transformation or organizational transformation, or at least transformation in how you approach life. So this, this, what we're gonna talk about today are kind of fundamental principles on what are, what are, how do you create an internal platform of strength from which to lead and, and, and what do you need to do, right? So here's what we're gonna do, okay. First, I'm gonna check like, how are you doing, right? Then we're gonna talk about how do you manage experience? Like how do you manage what happens inside you, right? Specifically then how do you manage fear? What zone you're in, what the question, that question will become clear in about 15 minutes. And then how do you draw on the resources you have to find energy to move forward, okay? And then we'll have time for Q and A. So as I said, this is not ideally a one-way dialogue. What I'm gonna put in the chat box is a link. And I'd like you to think about as you click on that link, it's, it's all anonymous, so uh, you can just give an answer. I'm gonna switch over to Windows, a window. So before you answer this, all right, I want you to think about the arc of your life from, June of, uh, from January of last year, the pandemic starts to pick up in March, right? We know something's happening, at least in this country at least, and then it starts to unfold. Right. Then you have uh, George Floyd and and all the other different killings that happen. Then you had in, in the summer, and then you had the election, and then you had all kinds of stuff happen. Right. And now a new year comes, an inauguration, springtime. Now it's June. The year's almost half over. Uh, and now the vaccination has kind of ramped up. We're now starting to look ahead, right? So what's, what comes up for you? You can put in as many words as you want, but just one at a time. 
And and I think there's always some people who've got uh, who can't uh, because of their device situation, right? Let me put this. Can't use the the, the link, but uh, just. So just you can put in as many words as you want, just one word at a time. That's that's all I ask. So let's take a look. Look at how this is building. So hopeful is the bigger. So just to you know how these things work is that the more people that put in the same word, the bigger the word becomes. So it's interesting, hopeful pulled ahead for a while there, overwhelmed and exhausted were kind of the bigger words. And here we go, just look at how does this build? And look, what, what I'd like you to notice is the range of the words. So some words, so I hear, I see hopeful, restless, stagnant, Angry, lonely, passionate, determined, optimistic, frustrated, self-loathing, right? Burned out, fed up, visionless, contemplative, cautious. Look at the grateful. Leave it up just for another five seconds or so. Look at the range, right? And acknowledging that you can feel a lot of these things simultaneously, right? I can feel exhausted and I feel hopeful, right? I can feel optimistic and I, there might be incredible sadness that's going on because of the things that I, I've experienced, right? Okay, this is beautiful, right? Look at, look at the whole range of human experience. I mean, this and the complexity of what we've experienced over the last year and a half. All right, so thank you. I'm gonna shift over to the next, let me just, let's take one final look here. Anticipation, yeah, look at that. So there's, hopeful is the dominant word and then followed up by a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Excited, anticipation, contemplative, anxious is the second set and it looks like Overwhelmed, cautious, grateful, exhausted, frustrated is the third set. And then you've got a whole bunch of stuff scattered in between, right? Okay, beautiful. So here's what it was a year ago, or uh, sorry, not a year, a year and three months ago or so. And this is kind of reflective of all the polls I did over the year, but we had uncertainty, anxiety, tired, and it basically was this through the end of, of the year. And I actually got more and more tired through the end of the year. So interesting how things have shifted, right? So we've certainly turned a corner. Stephen mentioned I teach at the Drucker School of Management. One of the things that Drucker, one of his core insights was that you can't manage other people unless you manage yourself first. And that leadership is defined by results, right? We have to produce some kind of result. That's what we're here for uh, in, in our professional capacity. So how do you manage yourself and how do you produce results in the world? If you put those two ideas together, you get something that looks like this, right? We have two things to do. I have to manage and be effective of the context outside me, right? And I have to manage the context and stuff going on inside me, all the feelings, the emotions, the frustrations, the beliefs, Right? The physical sensations, you know, you open up your email and you see the, the email from the colleague you don't like and you feel the sense of dread, right? How, do you, how does that influence, you know, your next moment, right? So from a leadership point of view, a leader has to do two things, to be able to understand and manage the context outside themselves and be effective there and also be effective in managing what goes on inside. And ideally, how do you do that in real time? Let me give you a concrete example. There's a, uh, an organization I work with in the Bay Area and 
uh, have, in that organization is a partner who I have worked closely with who's famous for her short temper. She is in a meeting with a key client of hers. This person represents several millions of dollars worth of business for her firm. In this meeting, somebody says something inflammatory and this wave of anger rolls through the room, including through my client who is easily angered. <laughs> she looks over at the, her client and he is now kind of gathering his papers, right? And getting ready to leave. You can imagine if he gets up and walks out the door, her career is kind of done. So she was a very good student. And she did, so she notices first, goes to the inner game. What's going on inside me? Oh, I notice I'm angry too. She takes her palms, puts them on the top of the table. That gives her attention somewhere to go, somewhere solid to go, rather than being taken off by the anger that's, that's inside her, right? So she puts her palms on the tabletop that buys her a minute or a moment to let the anger subside. Then she turns her attention back out into the room and she acknowledges what was happening, right? Somebody said something unfortunate and that she re deftly redirects their attention in a positive direction. She looks over at her client and his papers are back down on the table, right? She saved the day. So she was able to do all of this stuff after a lot of practice, but she was able to do it in real time. And, and that's kind of what we're aiming for. I mean, you don't start out that way, but you, that's where you aim toward, to be able to do that in real time. At some point, sometimes, you know, in the last year and a half, my son will come in here, he's five, you know, he will come in here either unclothed or with a sign that says some, something that he wants you to know about, right? And then, and then I got to manage that moment, right? So like, what's going to happen today? He's, he's taken care of today, uh, but uh, uh, so risk of that today is low. Um, but you get what I'm saying, right? There's two things we have to do. So a lot of the time, we don't know what's, what we're actually experiencing inside. Right? We don't know that we're frustrated, angry, or, or irritated. And then that, if we don't know that, like 4% of the time, no, no, sorry, 30%, only 30% 30 of people can tell you what emotion they're experiencing in a given, at a given moment. So if I don't know what I'm experiencing in a given moment, how does that influence the choice that I perceive I have the action I take and ultimately the result I get, right? You can't manage other people unless you manage yourself first. So part of the story is, so think about this. If you're frustrated, angry, and impatient, how does that influence what you perceive as choices, right? And then ultimately the action you take and then the result you get. Now, this isn't to say don't ever feel frustrated, angry, or impatient right? Because, hey, we're human beings, but be aware of what you're actually experiencing. Likewise, like if you were to shift and say, okay, if you experience things through the lens of appreciation, calm, and joyfulness, does that shift like what you perceive as choices, actions, and, and then the result you get? The statement here is not to say feel positive all the time, right? That doesn't work. Maybe that might work for your new age aunt in Sausalito, right? But probably not for most of us. But what I want to say is that your internal state shifts what you perceive as options, right? That's the point I want to make. So it's good to be aware of what are you actually experiencing, right? So let's try this again. So th this is uh, a quote from uh, a leader I worked with who signed her team up for this, but then she said, oh, I, you know, I, I, I have this picture of myself of incredibly capable, but when I actually started to acknowledge what am I experiencing, she said, you know, I've been trying to outrun coronavirus for the last six months and, and wishing that it wasn't happening, right? So, right, if, so let's just do a little experiment right now. Like what's happening in your body? So let's be really specific. Put your attention in your lower back. 
right? If you put your attention in your lower back, what do you notice there, right? Your body is kind of a tuning fork that tells you your mental state. And a lot of the times, you know, I like to say that for, for many years, I had a long distance relationship with my body, right? Like I kind of lived up here and my body was somewhere else. And I had to, I had to train myself to sense what was I actually experiencing, right? So like, if you were to pay attention to what is happening in your lower back right now, what are words or phrases that come to mind? Is it, does it feel good? Is it loose? Is it relaxed? Is it tight? Is it achy? Right? What do you notice? And then like, what emotions do you notice you're experiencing? Boredom, regret, you signed up for this thing. Oh, I could be doing something more valuable than listening to this guy, you know, drone on and on. Right? And then like, what are the stories in your head? You know, what are the stories in your head? These, these are the three basic variables of what, what go, how you assess your own experience. Right? And just what happens if you just let them be there? Oftentimes, we are not comfortable with what we're experiencing, and so we try to push it away. Um, what happens if you don't do that? What happens if you just say, okay, this is what I'm experiencing right now, feeling a little anxious, or I feel a little frustrated, or, I, or I'm feeling angry? Or, you know, I feel joyful or I feel appreciative. I look outside the window and see greenery or whatnot or the sky and uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, All right? So like, what do you notice you're experiencing and can you bring a level of acceptance to, yes, right now, this is what I am in fact experiencing. So that's principle number one. I, I just told, told you principle number two is accept what we're experiencing, but what I want to I wanted to skip to principle three because this is where the juicy stuff is, right? Which is attention needs somewhere good to go. And if you do not intentionally look for what is going well, you will default to what is not going well and you over magnetize on that. And then uh, you over, sorry, you over focus on that and then that becomes your world. So case in point, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I went to, to Yosemite. My, my wife loves Yosemite. And so I go for her. Myself, I am a committed, great indoorsman. And, uh, uh, you know, give me a book and a kitchen and I'm fine, right? So I, I don't need to go outside. But she likes it, so I do it for her. So we're in Yosemite. And, you know, we've gone to Yosemite every, every year for the last 10 years. And... This year, it was so, for me, so powerfully obvious, right? The infestation of bark beetles and the devastation they're having on the forests in Yosemite is just un unmistakable. And I found myself in the days that we were there kind of focusing on that. And I like see my mood spiraling down. You know, we're in one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I noticed my attention is focused on like this really unpleasant aspect of what's going on. And so I use my own stuff and I said, okay, Jeremy, look, you're, you're like, your attention is getting magnetized to what is not going well, right? That is happening and that is real, right? They're, Bark beetles, bark beetles kill trees, trees die, they become vulnerable to forest fire, right? All of that. And there, what else is beautiful in your environment? That was the question I started asking myself, okay? So what I found was that, oh, there are also these wildflowers. And so I decided to focus on the wildflowers as well as the, as these, you know, dead forests. And that shifted my experience. Right? It shifted my experience and I, and I was actually able to enjoy myself. And I started to like, get into like, the, the morphology of wildflowers, which is kind of fascinating. But this is also feedback from a past participant. She said, oh, I realized that by, because I had focused on what was going wrong, I'd kind of pulled myself into this cul-de-sac. And that if I started to focus on other things, you know, not ignoring what was going wrong, but also there were other things that were beautiful and going well, strong, vibrant, that I could pull myself out of the cul-de-sac and see the larger picture, right? See a larger picture and then my energy came back, right? My energy came back. So the question I have for you is like, what are you giving your attention to? Right? And it's something which 
as a culture, we don't really talk about what we give our attention to, but like what you give your attention to is what your life becomes, okay? That's like a fundamental principle. Like what you give your attention to is what your life becomes. Your attention is the investment of your energy that turns into your experience. So if I, if I pay attention to baseball statistics, right? I, my life becomes that, right? And, that, and I get that kind of life, which is, is for a lot of people really interesting, right? If I pay attention to the morphology of wildflowers, I get that. That's the kind of life I get. Uh, so, you know, what you, what you give your attention to is what your life is. And if you give your attention to just bad news, to an unrelenting stream of bad news, that's what your mind becomes. So how do we become more conscious of what we give our attention to? Okay. So this gets us to the question, how do we then manage fear? Right. And which is why this is not a lesson on stress management, right? It, it's, it's something a little bit deeper than that. It's like really understanding what our survival impulses are and how do they distort perception? And then how, how do we manage it in a way that helps us be more effective? Fear reactions are there to help us survive, right? And that as with all emotions, they generate energy to produce a particular kind of response in this way to either defend ourselves, to get out of here or to freeze and hope that the predator walks by because predators don't, um, don't eat things that they perceive as dead, right? These are fundamental reactions that we have to survive. And, and we don't wanna live without them. People who don't have fear responses do dumb things, right? You know, that they get into cars with total strangers, you know, they touch hot, hot pans, you know, um, uh, because that protective instinct isn't there. So we don't want to get rid of our protective instinct, but we want to manage things in a way that's, that's appropriate. So as a friend of mine says, we are living in a 21st, 21st century world with a Stone Age survival system, a Stone Age alarm system. So we have this sophisticated culture we've created and an alarm system that's kind of geared towards something to a, to a world that that in a way doesn't exist anymore. And then of course, coronavirus has asked us to be even more sophisticated in our own responses, right? Like remember in the early days, don't touch yourself, don't touch your face, wash your hands. Uh, uh, they're, they're things that we're, we're uh, stay away from other people, right? And they're, a lot of our own natural impulses for how we cope with things, coronavirus asked us to do the opposite of, right? And so our survival system of threat, of, of uh, how do we feel, how do we manage the sense of feeling threatened, right? And like ask people to wear a mask and somehow that's threatening for people. You know, I, I saw some people saying, oh, I feel muzzled, right? Well, what, what does that, that's, that's activating something else that has nothing to do with coronavirus, right? So how do you manage and be more rational about your own protective responses so that they're actually helpful for you is one question. So when we talk about managing oneself, we really talk about at the first stage, managing one, one's nervous system, right? You know, we have 35 weeks of, of programming just about this topic. And so, so I'm giving you like the most fundamental thing that we have, right? And the fundamental thing is to manage yourself, you have to manage your nervous system first. So we have this, uh, one way you can think about how your nervous system works is that you, we have a green zone, right? And, and ideally the green zone is where we are most sophisticated. You know, one way, to, one way to think about it is a zone of coherence. And one of the themes that I've been talking to people about um, in the last year is like, how do you, in a sea of chaos, be an island of coherence? How do you be an island of coherence so that you can help other people be more, co more coherent as, as things are kind of chaotically swirling around us, right? So let's go through each of these really quickly. 
the red zone is when you're you're in a defensive state of wanting to attack or defend yourself or get out of the room, right? There's a lot of energy here. And uh, you can see in the parentheses, I put greater internal chaos, right? So if you think about this like a pot, um, the pot is boiling over, right? There's a lot of energy in the system and, and, and the pot is boiling over and, and you can't necessarily control the energy. So, um, right, it's the, it, two o'clock in the morning and the hamster wheel is still spinning. Uh, FDS is a disease I made up called frivolity deficiency syndrome, right? You're not able to, it, it's a serious disease, right? You see what's going wrong in every situation. I'm prone to this, by the way, so that's why I know it. Uh, uh, the cheeseburger chocolate axis is all the comfort food you've been, you know, we've all been eating, uh, turning out, it turns out like learning how to bake while you're confined to a small space for an extended period of time wasn't, you know, wasn't necessarily a great idea for your weight, uh, or at least mine, um, right? We get, we get impulsive decision, decision making uh, is impaired, tunnel vision, hypervigilance, all of that, okay? I would argue that probably March through June or July, we were all collectively in the red zone, right? Running as fast as we can to kind of keep up. Then at some point, the adrenaline runs out. For me, I, what I started to notice for a lot of people, I, I, a lot of my clients, this was August, September, and, and probably now, uh, energy, energy, the adrenaline starts to run out and that the nervous system sinks into a different layer of protection, which is shut down. And this isn't the pot is boiling over. It's like there's not enough energy in the pot and that the pot is frozen. And so here you've got um, exhaustion, depression. You don't want to see people, low energy, sadness. Uh, why bother? All of that. We saw some of that in the, in, the, um, in the word cloud, right? And then ideally, here's where you want to be, right? So when you go to the airport and you see those uh, consulting companies advertising, that say, you know, our people are our greatest asset, there should be a, uh, an asterisk that says, yeah, our people are our greatest asset when they're in the green zone, right? And this is where we're at our most sophisticated. We can see other people's point of view, we can adapt, we're, we're uh, flexible, all of that, right? So from a strategic point of view, from an organizational point of view, what I encourage people to think about is like, how do we stay, how do we create a system that helps us stay in the green zone? Because a lot of the times what we've done is create a system that helps us be in the red zone and maybe we sink into the black zone a lot of the time, right? So if you had to think about where you are, and I'm going to send you this, uh, I'll try to send you this. I, I will send this to Stephen and then Stephen will send you this, um, this uh, link. Can we do that, by the way, Stephen? Is that possible? To, yeah, okay. So like, where are you? here, right? And where are you at least a lot of the time? And so that, that would be one question. And if you're managing a group, how do you put on, kind of put on the table, hey gang, where are we? And then what do we need to do? You know, so uh, one thing I encourage people to do is think about what are their tells, you know, from poker, you know, the, the tells like, oh, hey, I got five aces here in my hand, right? You don't want to what are your tells that you're in the red zone? What are your tells that you're in the black zone? What are the tells you have that tell you, hey, I'm in the green zone, I'm doing all right. And if you had to make a list of like, what does this look like, sound like, and feel like for you, what would that be? And if you don't know what that answer is, the person you live with knows what that answer is, right? So I would encourage you to make, uh, make this a, a group conversation. And then, you know, what are the tells of the people around you? And that to, the reason why I think this is important is that to be able to make these kind of topics discussable, right? Because we're not just kind of units of labor kind of plugging away, but you know, that, that what's the quality of mind I'm bringing to, to my work or, or to my family is important to be able to talk about that because it's gonna impact the impact that you have, right? And so how do we start to have a conversation around this and, and make that discussable, right? So what zone, and, and so oftentimes what uh, people I work with will do is say, I'll just talk about what zone I'm in. Like what zone are we in, red, green, or black, right? And, and let's discuss it. What do we need to do, right? 
So here are ways of bringing up the issue. And, and, then, and then what I wanna close with is like, how do we start to get back into the green zone, right? And because this is where I think as a culture, we need to think about how do we live in the green zone more of the time, right? And so what I wanna do is kind of work, go through an exercise. We have 10 minutes left or so, is that right? So we'll do a really quick version of this exercise, which is, which I call, who's helped you? And if there's a version of this on my uh, SoundCloud, which I'll put in the chat, um, probably have to cut and paste that. So, okay, so let's do a little, let's do a quick little exercise. If you are able, if you are able to uh, do this in your environment right now, like if you're driving, don't do this, but uh, if you're a kind of stationary, uh, see what happens. But uh, just close your eyes if you're comfortable with that, right? So just I'm gonna close my eyes. So close your eyes, just notice what are you experiencing right now? First of all, let's just kind of set a baseline. Like, What do you notice? Notice your breathing, right? Notice the quality of uh, tension in your muscles. Right. Now bring to mind somebody from your life who has helped you. Right. Somebody who is the right person at the right time with the right kind of information or help or assistance that got you through some challenge you were facing. Right. Who is that person? And then imagine their face. Maybe it's smiling at you. All right, can you hear that person's voice? And as you hold that person's image in your mind, what does it feel like to be with that person? And as you hold that image in your mind, notice what's happening in your body. Right. Like what's happening in your body? And what did this person do that made your life better? Right? Do you notice something change? And imagine that that person is standing behind you right now, still giving you their support. If you sense like what you're experiencing right now, what's different? I put uh, put the link back in the chat. Oh, 
And what are words or phrases you would use to describe what changed? Yeah, beautiful. There's a version of this that's like 20 minutes long. And um, I'll, I'll maybe, let me bring it up here. I'm gonna put this in the chat. This is, um, I call it the who's got your back meditation, but uh, that's a link to that one. And then to the, what we just did, a, a longer version of what we just did. And then here's a link to um, a whole bunch of other stuff I made for the last year. So just take an, like, what do you notice? First of all, right? I'm gonna, this will still keep happening, but I'm gonna shift back to the first one we did. Right, hopefuls there, but notice notice the the words around it, and notice these. Right. Well, one thing I notice is that um, though there are fewer words, the words are more uniformly positive. And what I want you to know, what I want to point out, is all we did was shift your attention to something you already had, which was the experience of of one person helping you. You shift your appearance, you shift your experience, you shift your attention to something good. Attention needs somewhere good to go. So one thing you might do is think about who are five people in your life who helped you? And then print out a little picture <laughs> and then stick them somewhere where like, if you're not having a good day, you can look up and make contact with one of those five people or all five of those people. Right. And remind yourself, hey, you're not in this alone. Okay. So, all right, I want to give a few minutes to some questions, Stephen. And so if there's a... And like, what are you going to, what are you going to do differently? And I'm just going to leave this up here because I think this is a pretty amazing set of words. So there's um, 34 more weeks <laughs> of stuff we could do, but um, uh, and I'll, but yeah, any questions you have? What I wanted to do was really give you something practical that you could use, and uh, and it's not and it's not hard, right? I didn't say like you have to go off to the mountain for 10 days to meditate, right, in a cave somewhere under a waterfall. Um, but um, well, all you have to do is shift your attention. And, it, and, and that we did for three minutes. Imagine what it's like after 15. And imagine what it's like if you do it every day. Yeah. Stephen, oh, you might be muted, I think. A couple of questions we got for you, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, please. One is, uh, how, how can we distinguish between negative events that uh, we don't need to focus on versus those that we should be focusing on, such as social justice? Mm. One, it's a fantastic question. The social, the social justice question is a whole conversation unto itself. My point of view is how do you use these painful events as ways of energizing you? But then how do you also not act out of anger? Right? even though that the situations may be incredibly angering, right? because then it, then it just perpetuates the anger. Yeah. So again, it's inside, outside. How do I manage the inner game so I can be effective externally? Okay. So, so that, that's one, you know, given that obviously we could go into it way, way deeper. Uh, Patricia's question, tips on this, uh, rolling this out to my team. 
first start talking about it. Where are we? Right? And then I have to say that in the in the organizations that I work with that have handled this really well, this being, you know, what I call pandemic plus, um, the experience of all this is that they prioritize the relationships they have, right? They prioritize the relationships over the work process. So putting the relationships first about, I think is one, is, is the way to go. Right. And then how do you, so first, how do we talk about it? And second, just talking about, okay, what do we need? Like, what do we need? And, and maybe doing things that are connective, that not just productive. Right. And in the end, right. The connective stuff leads to productive. And, and I'm happy to have a, a, lar a longer conversation about this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. I, I know we're, we're running out of time here, but uh, just a couple comments for people that uh, we will be sharing the recordings uh, with you um, and can share the slides with you too. Um, but uh, Jeremy, we've got a question in terms of uh, somebody, a couple people want to find out how do we get more information on the other 35 weeks? Yeah, well, if you want to come to the Drucker School, you're welcome. The, uh, uh, we do it every year and it starts with how do you manage a moment and it ends with how do you manage change? And, and the arc in between that is a really, it's one of a fascinating arc of transformation. And actually one of your colleagues is gonna be my uh, uh, guest on my, on my podcast next week, which is who's the head of a water district and one of my former students and uh, which will be a really great conversation. Hold on a second, I'll give you the link to podcast, which is here. So let's see. And then there's some questions here in the chat. Uh, okay, does this practice put you more in reality or less in reality, or does it create a new reality? This is interesting. One of the things I'm working on right now is like a perceptual orientation towards leadership, which, um, you know, what you perceive is what, what becomes real. And, and we don't really do a lot of training and perception in this culture. And so, I don't know, do you, do you feel more in touch with reality if you acknowledge people who've helped you? Uh, or less, like, uh, you know, let yourself answer that question, right? And, and part of that is to be able to have a wider perception of reality, not just what's going wrong. You know, in my own case, in dealing with illness, yes, I, I was living with a disease that was killing me and there were other things happening. There were other good things happening in my life that I could focus my attention on. So like my, so that, that's where I developed this rule, attention needs somewhere good to go. So the, the question I would ask people is what is enlivening to you? Like literally, what gives you energy? And put your attention there because that'll give you the energy to deal with the things that are more challenging. At least that's been true in my experience. Uh, Excellent. How can these practices help staff with neurodiversity? That's interesting. That's, uh, let's see. I think understanding, well, one, that's such a complex question, Heather. And next week when you're on my podcast, maybe we can talk about it. But uh, um, the one is seeing how people use their perception, maybe from a very basic point of view, it's like how do people use their perception in, in the first place? Like it helps people to see that and how, how each of us are different in that. I, and may, maybe that's the best I can do in a 10 second answer. So. Thank you. And uh, just to clarify the podcast, um, uh, Jeremy has given the, uh, the website for that. That's the one, the untaught essentials, right? Right. Perfect. So grab that uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, people were out of time, um, but uh, you can just tell that we've touched the tip of the iceberg here. 
Um, we've got a lot of great programs that we run here from CGU, um, including uh, the, the, the one Jeremy's talked about, um, including a brand new master's uh, in leadership uh, that Jeremy teaches um, a class on in. Uh, so encourage you to contact us if you want more. Um, we'll also be sending out a, a survey within the next week just to kind of get your reaction to this webinar series. Um, we put these on for you to try and um, offer something of a value and we'd love to get your reaction in terms of how we did this year and how we could improve this for, for continuing the series in the future. So with that, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank um, you. And uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. That's great. See you. See you, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. See you next week, Heather. <laughs>